You are recording. Hello, everyone. My name is Min Vu. I'm an L1. L, I almost said L1. What the world's <laughs> going on? L2 from Cincinnati, Ohio. So we're here to discuss community building. So community building. And, um, and a thing called collective effort, community building one step at a time. OK, let's see if I can get this into my hands and therefore get this done. OK. So, OK. So yeah, I am shamelessly stealing magic art. So <laughs> sorry, wizards. I'm just borrowing this for a presentation. Hope you don't mind. <laughs> so, but before we start, of course, as with all slides, you have to have a conflict of interest. I, I Minvu, has no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. And uh, well, don't add me about that part of it. You can add me about other things. We'll discuss adding <laughs> later. <clears throat> So our objectives for today is we're going to identify about community building is we'll break it up to three main objects. <clears throat> Identifying and building your local infrastructure. Next, we need to talk about growing a player base, getting people started, getting people moving, and then finally advancing your player base, moving them so they can actually move toward, toward the larger, more competitive tournaments that we're used to. So, <clears throat> okay. okay, so first thing we have to talk about is people. People is, without people, we don't have a magic community, obviously, because you need players to play the game. But the first people that are most invested in building a magic community are your store owners. So I emphasize here at the very beginning to put store owners first, employees second. The people that actually are paying the bills are the most important people you need to talk to and get to know. As judges, we are, as judges and larger just community organizers in general, you need to know What's everything going to cost? You need to present these things to them. Sometimes it's going to, you're going to look like you're presenting some sort of random business plan saying, here's the tournaments, here's what payout I expect, this is what I think would be a good idea to charge. And they're going to ask you things like, <clears throat> how much should I charge? What's prize payout going to be? Those are questions that, as a judge and a community builder, you're going to be able to be facing. It's something you have to address. So overall, building that rapport with the store owners is a huge step. Especially if you are over multiple stores. Like when I was in Cincinnati at the very beginning, I was the, I was the only judge in the entire city circa eight years ago. I made a point to visit every single store and, and meet every store owner. It says, hi, my name is Min, how are you doing? I am a judge in this area, now we have one, uh, unlike previous years where there was none. So I'm a resource for you. If we want to do these kind of events, let me know. I can, I can be here, be, judge, be a judge for your event. I'm a resource in case you have rulings, that sort of thing. Just be available. One thing about this is making these what I like to call old school ambassador visits, which I still do to this day. I have one scheduled, I think, next week for a brand new store. Usually, I, if you want to start doing FNMs, is usually when I truly do the first ambassador visit. Some stores, if they're like <clears throat> really struggling, I may come in a little bit earlier than that. But go in there and say, hi, my name is Min, here's my contact info, and make sure they know like, hey, I'm not just trying to do this. There's a couple players in my comic book store that wants to play Magic, and we have no idea what we're doing. Can you help us out? Or get people to notice that we exist is a big thing. One thing about this, though, is when you're coming in there, you're doing it in this a somewhat official capacity. Like, whenever I went, this is a time to use, like, your Great Lakes polo, your Judge polos, even your Judge Blacks. This is a time to use it. I know it's usually it's like, we don't use those except during tournaments as official attire. It's like, this is a pretty official business. And whenever people, you're meeting people for the first time, especially business-type people thinking along those lines, because they're their owners, Looking good is important here. First impressions are huge when we're, when we're trying to be the when we're being ambassadors. Okay, so <clears throat> so store owners first step. Next, <clears throat> store employees. These are the front lines. Like we are pseudo store employees are at least arms of the store owners when we're being judges, right? When you work for Channel Fireball, when you work for SCG, you are viewed as almost arms of the TO. For that reason, you need to get to know the store employees, know their habits, know, and also know that they are speaking on behalf of not just the store, but also the game itself. If they are sitting there and they're 
spouting memes and not being very inclusive and just being like, ah, ha, 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 here's an inside joke, inside joke, inside joke, it's not going to help you build your community. Because someone walks in, they listen to a lot of things, people are laughing, and they're just completely lost. They probably aren't going to come back. So making sure we have a welcome community that cues them in. Like even if there is an ins there's a joke or a terminology they don't know, make sure someone, anyone, store employees probably best, judges, community leaders, etc., cues them in, say like, oh, that's what this means. That way it's like, oh, I feel like I'm a member of this community, I want to come back. Without that, the, without that sort of infrastructure of people being the groundwork, we aren't going to go in. Fellow judges. The next step is, hey, I'm a judge, but what other judges are here? Earlier on, whenever I was the only judge in the city, it was easy. It was me. <laughs> there was no one else. But as, but that also comes with duty. It's like I'm the only judge. Who else could be a judge? Who else could I in this community needs that mentoring? Needs that tutoring? Identify those people and be like, what can I do to help them out? As an L1, you can help tutor, tutor them and then find that, help them find that L2. As an L2, you can make them the L1. These are things that you can move forward and do when you're building your community. So you can have more leadership, more leaders, and they have their own ideas. And maybe they can, you can add them into the fold. I had some new judge, a new judge enter my region, my, not region, my little area, I guess, recently. He came, he reached out, he said, hey, I would like to meet. I met with him at an FNM. We were talking about what's popular, what's not popular, how, how our area works, and what initiatives he wants to do. So that's all important things. Lastly, community leaders. Magic players are clicky. You know this. You watch around and you see little pods of people and they're all discussing the stuff. But if you're trying to build community and you want to have enough density of people coming to events, you need to get inroads to all these little community groups. <clears throat> and usually, often, they have like one person that's kind of their hub person that coordinates things. Get to know them. <clears throat> get to know them, and they will bring the other people with them. That's huge. Like, I'm in at least three small click Facebook groups. They're like, hey. And I was like, I got in, and now I can advertise or talk to about events or coordinate with them and see what they want to see. That's important when we're trying to establish the infrastructure of people. So next, locations. Local game store is the most obvious of the locations. We need to know which ones are there, which ones are available. <clears throat> yes, you can use the uh, WPN app to find some of the stores, but know what level and what, how frequent your stores are. Is this a WPN store that is, uh, they do magic, uh, once every couple of weeks, they're mostly Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, and they don't do much magic. Or they do comic books, and they might do a draft once in a while if they pushed all the comic books off the table, and now they have room, and they can pull out the chairs, and then they can have a draft. If they're that kind of store, you need to know that. That way you're not investing a ton of time if you're not going to get a huge amount of return on it. But also in that store, you need to know, I want to host a 100-person charity tournament. Can this store handle it? <clears throat> That's huge. You know, what's, do they have extra tables? Do they have extra chairs? Do they have all these things for the store location to work? <clears throat> Next is alternative sites. Alternative sites like libraries, coffee shops, breweries, are places where you can have magic events, but maybe someone won't be sanctioned, and that's OK. Part of building a match community is not always tournaments, 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 tournaments. If it's a fun hangout, a, a learn to play magic event in a library, that's also part of community building. Don't think it's just, it has to be nothing but tournaments. <clears throat> so learn to play, like recently WPM gave us a new avenue of the 16 or under tournaments or whatever age group or under tournaments we can start having at alternative sites like libraries. That's a great thing we can start doing. But other things like coffee shops. Heck, um, about six-ish years ago, a store on the eastern side of Cincinnati closed down. Well, the players still wanted to meet up. So instead of meeting at the store that was closed, they met in the Waffle House that was in the parking lot. And they met there for two months. They were just consistently, every Friday, they invaded that Waffle House and it took over for like a solid couple hours. Waffle House employee, one of the, one of the players was a manager of that Waffle House, which helped. 
So I didn't have to let them sit there for several hours, but <coughs> that's what they <coughs> Pardon me. That's what they did for about two months until another LGS opened up. Well, technically it was a hobby shop that did miniatures that opened up that welcomed them in with the help of a, a local L1 that helped them arrange that entire thing. But yeah, <clears throat> know that alternative sites are a thing. Like, breweries is a very weird one. People are like, what? You play magic and do booze? What? Sometimes I've had a local, they do board games. There was a local board game meetup at a brewery. That's one of those open seating breweries where they, they're okay with you sitting there for like four hours. They started playing, they came there and met to play board games. And eventually they decided, let's play magic. And that became part of their rotation. And people co up and a little slowly a small magic community was building around a brewery. And that's okay. As long as, well, Usually they keep their budgets pretty low and they play pre-cons, so if, they, if their cards get destroyed, it's not so bad. <clears throat> but it's a thing. Just, but off, obviously, WPN, with their new sanctioning rules, probably won't let a, brew, <coughs> a brewery through. Because with their alternative sites, they have to be like, hey, we still need to maintain a family-friendly environment. And most breweries, despite being open to everyone and maybe having a restaurant attached aren't really that family friendly, let's be honest with ourselves. So, <clears throat> but it's an, it's, an op it's an option. So don't shut down things offhand. But next thing about locations is traffic and parking. A lot of us live in cities or even some or distant areas where the local game stores are not necessarily in the center of everything and have great parking and you can get to it easily. Some people, eh, it's gonna be a bit rough to get to, get to the locations. So you, the store is gonna make some compromises. So paying attention to traffic. <clears throat> Don't start your FNM at 5.30 if you're a little bit off and the traffic, realistically, no one's gonna arrive until six o'clock. Don't start your FNM at 5.30. Pay attention to, the, to traffic trends and that sort of things where we can see how people move. Because sometimes, <coughs> <coughs> If it's going to take them an hour to get there, they may be like, eh, I'll play Moto or whatever. Or I'll go do something else. I'll go home and play Hearthstone and I'm not going to play Magic. Those are things that people will do if they suddenly have to fight an hour of traffic. So be mindful of that. Parking is another thing. If most of all, coming to an LGS is usually free. Just coming by, hanging out is usually a free option. But any barrier, like paying for parking, some LGSs are paying for table for hangout table space. Those are barriers that players are aware of. I see you have some question face, but you can, there are people that were, they will charge you for a table. <clears throat> it happens, but it also depends on your community. If you are in an area like here in the good old Midwest where we have room to spread out, then probably never gonna happen here. But if you're in a tight knit place, large cities, Europe, it's more realistic that you might be having table charges. So you have to, but mind you, a table charge may turn away a new player. So you have to pay attention to those, those little barriers. <clears throat> Finally, amenities. These are things like making sure there's food nearby, making sure they have adequate number of bathrooms for a number of players you're gonna deal with. You don't want 120 players to descend upon a one juice bathroom. Probably not a good idea. Making sure that bathroom is clean, make sure that bathroom clean so both genders feel like they can actually use it. There are plenty of bathrooms where, oh God, I, if I had to sit, I would not want to do that. But some genders don't have that option. So be careful about such things. That's the reality we face. So make sure that bathroom is clean. Make sure it's maintained. Don't have a store that goes, well, I'm about to have f and have For the next eight hours, I'm gonna have approximately 60 people loss moving in and out, and we clean the bathroom once, and we're never gonna touch it for the rest of the afternoon. <clears throat> Not a good thing. Make sure you ma maintain those sort, of, those sort of facilities, okay? Also, other amenities, having food nearby. I remember one, for a pre-release, one store owner actually contacted local food trucks, being like, well, there's no good food near us. <clears throat> hey, let's get some food trucks out here. It worked out great. They sold a ton of they sold a ton of food while they're out there. So pay attention to those amenities. So sometimes location is great. I know one store that's right near an escape room, which you would think, well, why don't they just they would go to the escape room instead of go play magic? 
But actually, it works out quite well because a lot of Magic players love playing puzzles. So they show up at Magic Store, play some Magic, <clears throat> and then they have their assigned time to go to the to escape room. They go to the escape room, they come back to play more Magic. <clears throat> they just make a day of it. So be mindful of like, things that you may view as competitors are actually a boon to you. So locations are huge. And I'll touch on one last thing, which is a very odd statement. If you can, about locations is have location, like having two stores near each other isn't necessarily a negative, as long as the two store owners work with each other. It's big to have store owners communicate and talk. If you have two, if you're like, oh, we make sure we don't run tournaments at the same, like tournaments of the same format at the same time, then you aren't really competing. You're doing alternative products. And that way, if players like, I don't have this, I'm going to go to the other store, or you don't have this, I'm going to go to the other store, you have both of you selling to each other. So that's huge. <clears throat> So make sure that <clears throat> store locations <clears throat> work together. They don't compete as much. <clears throat> okay, finally, media. This is where they don't add and it comes back out. <clears throat> Some stores have websites. They're okay. Most of our local stores kind of have meh websites that are usually, mostly their TCG player front, if that, <clears throat> and not much else. But overall, having your events and everything advertised are, is huge to have on, the, on their website. And then some people, their website is their social media. Their website is essentially their Facebook page and they really don't have anything else. So social media presence is also a big thing for, big thing for stores. So having command of that, either you run it yourself or you're able to tell them, hey, you need to say these things or present this stuff or let people know that well, we're not having a midnight pre-release this time, or midnight pre-release is changing to this, or pre-release times are shifting, we're doing a two-headed giant this time. Those kind of things are stuff that needs to be announced, and you need to have a good command of media to do that. <clears throat> local, local web pages are something else you can do. Like, I, I, as I said, I'm in a couple Facebook groups. Some of them have their own pages where we discuss magic on different topics. I run a P local PPTQ sheet where I keep track of all the PPTQs in the area, <coughs> they're registered, including start times, who's judging it, and all those sorts of things. Originally, it was an internal document. It was just for me. No one else was supposed to see it, and I could arrange and set everything up. And then I decided, well, why do I need this to be an internal document? There's no reason for that. So I cleaned it up. I added a list of the stores and addresses so players could find them. I Bought a, I, made a, I made a choice later to buy a URL, which I probably should have done a long time ago. I would use tiny URL to be cheap, but spend the extra money, get an actual www. I have cincypbq.com, and just links to a Google sheet. But having that available so players can see stuff is huge. But I'll be honest, flyers are the best. Having something in hand that they can see, pick up, and grab, and bring with them is so much easier than having them go, hey, go to this website. Because most, hey, go to this website, people will ignore over time. There's so many people, so much stuff going, so, so many things going on that they're not going to pull it up. If they pull it up right there, it'll be okay. But if you try to remind them to pull it up later, not happening. So, for when PBTQs just started, I would print, like literally I had my PBTQ site, I would print it out and hand it, and I had a stack of them at all the, at the stores, being like, here's the PBTQ locations. And that way they have PBTQ locations, they knew where they are, they know what formats there are, they know what start times they had, so they had everything out there up front. So managing media and media presence is huge, because it's not just you conveying information, but you taking in information, which is huge. Facebook, like Facebook for stores is one thing where they, they can broadcast events, but also can get feedback from players being like, this didn't go well. I've had that happen multiple times where players said, you started late, why are these always starting late? That's something you, that they need to hear and they need to get that feedback from. And sometimes you never know, some fun things could happen. Um, my favorite one recently was, I did not know there was a magic artist in my area. Didn't know. It's like, what? Uh, how did this pop up? So what happened was the artist on Twitter said, I, I have a card in Dominaria. I totally want, I would love to go to a pre-release. Sent out that, she sent out that tweet into, into his fields. Then a podcaster who follows him said, 
hey guy, retweeted like, hey guys, who can help this guy find a, find a <clears throat> pre-release in Northern Kentucky? A judge who follows that podcast, which wasn't me, said, hey man, this is the way to go. Ed Farms is a judge. Hey, this person's trying to find a try to find a, try to find a pre-release. Can you help him? I'm like, and I thought, magic artist, that's something I can work with. So then I was like, where is he? He's in Northern Kentucky. What are my stores nearby? Contact the store owners, because I have contacts with them. They're like, hey, we have a, we have a magic artist that wants to play in a pre-release. You want to do something with this? Sure enough, one of the store owners bit. He invited the, the <clears throat> artist to come by, paid for his pre-release. The artist came by, signed some cards. It was a nice little event. They added a little bit more spice to that pre-release. So having a presence is big. So spend your time not just whenever you're handling media just to project things, but also be able to intake things in. <clears throat> Next, let's go in. So any questions before we move on to player base building? Anything, feedback, thoughts, questions? Flyers are great. I don't do, I don't do enough flyers. It's a very good point. Flyers are underrated, horribly you're underrated. You're right, you're right. <clears throat> okay, so next, player base building. You know what, I'm gonna put these down since I have a screen up here. I yeah. didn't know we'd have that. So tip for presentations, generally have your slides in front of you, but if they have a screen to do it, you kind of don't need the paper. I got you, buddy. Yeah, it's nice, so nice. Okay, next thing. So assessing player building. Next, assessing average player skill. So this is important whenever you are relatively new to a store and you have to think, okay, so what kind of store am I dealing with here? Are they playing mostly welcome decks and pre-constructed commander decks and they're not really <clears throat> playing standard, they're not really high skill level? Are they, oh no, we are draft grinders, we know, we know everything, we will do, we'll go to PPTQs and we're fine. You have to understand where your players are at. Because sometimes, Sometimes the players are not, if you're trying to build that community, you can't just go, okay, let's do vintage. And they're like, uh, what? <laughs> we barely, what is a vintage? <laughs> are we talking about records or old comic books? No, we're not talking about that. So make sure we have the idea of where our player skill level is. Identifying what's popular. When you're there and you're getting building community, you, sometimes there's a small community already building what's popular. Do people come in there to play standard or are they come in there to draft? Are they there for modern? Is it just a booming commander night and there's nothing else going on? Know what's, identify what's popular and use that as a baseline to figure out what you can work with. Next, leverage current events. Right now, the hot commodity is legacy because Deathrite Shaman got banned and then also Gatash and Crab, whatever, but, but Deathrite Shaman got banned and somehow people are slowly thinking, ooh, I can play legacy. I have not played in forever. I can dust off my blue-black reanimator deck. I've never used that one in years because Deathrite Shaman's just made it non-existent. Deathrite Shaman, like, <clears throat> so if there's trends like that, jump on it. If it's, oh look, there's this thing called Tiny Leaders. Maybe we should build decks, that thing. I think I could build a blah, blah, blah Tiny Leader deck. I think I could build blah, blah, blah. Stop. People will talk, that's great. Our job as community organizers is to get them from talking to play. <clears throat> So arrange that event, be like, well, y'all want to do a Tiny Leader event? Let's do a Tiny Leader event. <clears throat> get them moving, get them, get them actually going from talking to playing. That's what we want to have happen. Because that's what's going to build, like, actually see, does the event have to, ha does the format have legs? You won't know until you actually play it. No one's going to, people will talk about things for ages, but stores aren't, they're not going to buy cards from stores. They're not going to show up for events. Your community's not going to grow by mostly just chatting about it. <clears throat> get people started, get people playing, and that's the biggest thing we can do. So, it can be Tiny Leaders, it can be Frontier, it can be Brawl, it can be any of those things where it's whatever's the hottest thing they're talking about, jump on it. <clears throat> but, as I said, get players playing. This is the biggest thing whenever you're introducing new players, get cards into their hands and play. Even if it's not their cards, Sometimes, if you want to start a, start a new format off nothing, you need to provide the decks. That's one of the biggest things you can do. Do you want to start play, playing standard? Standard definitely has an on-ramp and challenger decks where you can like, have something that you can hand them that actually works. But if you want to start people playing modern, playing uh, legacy, anything like that, put cards in their hands and get them to play. 
That's the biggest thing we can do. Who here knows the actual official wizard's line of beginning prayer products? Anyone? So the first thing, Wizards is, agrees with this month mentality because the first thing they try to get you to push on players is the free welcome decks, which are ready to go, unwrap it, play. It gets them to play as soon as possible. Instead of going, instead of having everything go with, this is anatomy of a magic card, this is the name, here is the mana cost, this is what's known as the type line. No, we don't do that. <coughs> You go, see, here's mana, you kind of pay with like this stuff, you tap for this much, and you throw a fireball in their face. Like, we get them playing as soon as possible. Even if they don't do it right the first couple times, that's okay. As long as they kind of feel it, get them emotionally invested, that's the most important part. Get them playing. So, first thing is the welcome decks. Next step is the, anyone? Planeswalker decks. Planeswalker decks is the next step. So, it introduces planeswalkers, which are what? It's almost like you did that for three days straight. <laughs> push that on people. Yes, we push planeswalker decks, and then the slight hex on them, because what does that do? It introduces more complex mechanics, like what the heck is a planeswalker, and then the pack, so they can feel like they can edit slightly the deck. Usually, doesn't really help them because it's all the odds of them opening cards in their colors that works for them is not super high, but <clears throat> it's something where they can start, they can actually feel like they can tweak things. The next step is technically the deck builder's toolkit, according to Wizards. <clears throat> and that way, because deck builder's toolkit comes with preset cards, so they have an idea of what a deck should look like. And then from there, it's from boosters and all. I'm not a huge fan of deck builder's toolkit. I think it's better, I think one of the things they just implemented, which is the single color packs, have you ever heard of those? They're in big box stores and literally it's one of each color and you can buy just a single color and be like, I like white. I will buy this pack as nothing but artifacts and white cards. It's for players who are just getting started and they usually, when players just getting started, they have a favorite color or colors. And that way they can play with just those colors and they don't have to worry about playing with everything. It narrows their focus so they don't have to look at all the colors and think about all the colors. It's, I can focus on my couple handful of colors. Which is the reason why I like this on-ramping style <clears throat> before jumping into the pre-release. The pre-release, people, is a big on-ramping tool because, well, it has a lot of people. As I said, from the first set we had to talk about is people. Having people is what makes people want to play Magic. So that's the reason why a lot of people want to think pre-release is a great place for new players because you get to talk to people, interact with people. But if you're a new player, building a deck is a daunting task. You have new mechanics that no one knows. So if you ask someone like, hey, how does this work? They may not know. We're judges, so we're gonna help them. But if you're onboarding lots of people at once, if, and you don't feel like, lec and we're trying to avoid the lecture you on how these mechanics work, then it's not necessarily <coughs> not a great place to be. So, overall, that's why, and also, sometimes you'll run into those players that walk in and be like, I'm playing a pre-release. I only play blue and red, and I don't play any other colors. And they open up their pool, and their blue red, and their blue red pool is trash, and you know it. And you're, and they will, and then they'll start losing, and you will inevitably, hopefully, as a good judge, walk over and say, Hey. You seem frustrated, maybe I can help you fix your deck, and your fix of deck is don't play blue-red, is the one thing they don't want to hear, because they don't want to play other colors yet. They're not at that level yet. So be careful, the pre-release is can be a bit of a daunting task for a lot of people, and you have to wait till one, they're comfortable with multiple colors and things like that before you can really jump into the pre-release. But get them play. Get them play, and afterwards, have that talk. <clears throat> What did you like? What did you not like? What would you edit? Those are things that we can, we can start getting discussion after they go, okay, I'm now invested because I've now played it, I've experienced it, and I want more. So let's, let's talk. So another thing about new players is budget. Budget's a big thing nowadays. Every, cards are getting more expensive. MTG Finance is thick. So play, new players obviously are looking for barriers. One of the big barriers is money. That being said, 
we have to be very careful of what we can do to say, hey, I have this new growing player base. What can I do to introduce them to play constructive formats? So the obvious thing is go for the budget formats. The biggest popper being the one of the more popular ones, although some of the popper cards are not super cheap, but <clears throat> I'm looking at you, Oubliette. But outside of that, they're generally reasonable. So popper decks is a good way to start. Brawl is another one. I know a lot of people are like, really? Brawl? No one plays Brawl. But Brawl is a great... <laughs> See? Look, I'm, I'm having some reactions to that. Actually, actually, I do have a Brawl deck. So, but Brawl is a great, <coughs> great budget format. And it avoids some of the pitfalls of Commander, which we'll talk about later. But Brawl is a great budget format, because if you have expensive cards, you need one of them. And sometimes you may not draw it, so you can just use those budget substitutes. So Brawl, another great budget format that people underrate, I believe. Other budget formats include, I do a local $50 EDH, where you have to, you build your deck, but we set to be MTG Goldfish $50 within a week. Send, like, if it's a tournament, we send screenshots, but for most of us, we just kind of share it on a website and say, hey, look, I'm good. So that way we all have like similar power-ish power level decks and we can enjoy it. Enjoy. Um, one thing's in our local area, we did what's called, I think, Cheapo Supremo, which was $25 vintage, where you can do whatever you want as long as the deck's under $25. <laughs> which was quite popular for a while. It was quite popular for a while. It was great. Like, people love to brew all sorts of things. I think Mono Black was really big for a bit, and then people tried to play Tinker. So it's a very interesting format that ended up around $25 vintage. But it's a great budget format where people can, like, do all sorts of nonsense and try out stuff. That way they don't feel fully invested. They're not playing a six to $700 standard deck. So these are ways to get people on board and playing without having that barrier of price being one of the issues. Okay, okay. potential threats. Leagues are a threat because they act on the other part of other barrier entry, which is time. People only have so many hours in a day and only so many days in a week. So if someone signs up for a league and they realize I need to, I have to play in this league for, if it's like two month league, that's a two month commitment once a time a week. That's a lot of commitment to ask for a new player when they're first getting started. Not exactly the ideal. Like, so Wizards have changed up their leagues recently to be more open, where it's like just play X number of matches over that course of time. It usually, instead of starting with a sealed deck where you just have packs, you start with the Planeswalker deck. So once again, we remove the barrier of deck building away from them. <clears throat> so those tend to be slightly more successful, but overall, I'm not a big fan of leagues. It's just way too much commitment for those players. And finally, let's talk Commander. Commander and new players is a weird, weird animal because we have a lot of intro command products. We have the commander precons, but those commander precons are chock full of lots of mechanics that they've never seen before, and maybe only on a single card, and they don't want to spend time learning all this stuff for the format. And then when you're playing commander, if a, as this frequently discussed on multiple commander podcasts, the worst thing to happen when playing commander is playing commander decks where the commander decks are so different in scope and power that you're not really playing with each other at all. And sometimes you'll be leaving either in five minutes or three hours later completely miserable. And those are not things we want to have happen. That's why I tend to like Brawl more so than Commander, because Brawl, being standard, really streamlines the power levels that you have to deal with. So I'm a bigger fan of Brawl rather than Commander in these events, although there's a drive because of Commander's popularity, because as I said, people trump most of everything else we have to deal with. And secondly, we do have product. Like, we don't have a pre-con brawl deck. That doesn't exist yet. But we have pre-con commanders. So, let's move on to the next thing. Advancing your players. So this is after we got them in, we got them playing. Now what? Now we want them to play in tournaments. That's what people want to play. We want them to play in, because that's what we know, right? We're judges. But compet tournaments, competitive tournaments are scary. Not as scary as this photo, but scary. Good photo. <laughs> <clears throat> well, if, you, if you're the brand new player and there are a bunch of sharks, it does feel like this. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so, managed tournaments are scary. And that's an issue. The second barrier we have are 
It's expensive, these competitive tournaments. A lot of these competitive tournaments circle around what? Standard, modern, sometimes legacy. Those are expensive formats, especially for newer players. So those $60. What? Entry to GPs is $60. Entry fees is $60. At least. At least. We can have a long discussion about that because because I can show you, uh, wait till I, I want to, we'll discuss what was in the old judge packets <laughs> later. <laughs> All old judge packets. Okay, so advancing your deck's familiarity. So the first thing about making it scary, or making it feel less scary, is to let them know what's going on. So first thing is, if they're, if they're past the newbie stage, they know what's going on, they've, met, they've played some magic, now it's like, hey, um, we did this wrong, can you help us? Tell them, if this was a tournament, we'd do this. Or, and if they're already past FNM, if we're at a competitive tournament, we do this. That way they know like, what the fixes would be and what, what they would happen to them. Be like, oh, you get a warning. A warning means this. So they know like, hey, these are, there are fixes and well, that doesn't sound horrible. It's not like it's like, well, you get disqualified for that. Like, you generally won't. They think they will get DQ'd for rules and fractions, which they don't. So players, you have to meet them where they are. Talk to them. Discuss rulings at, as though you're in a tournament occasionally. That way they can feel introduced. They're so like, well, maybe these are okay. I don't have to feel like I'm really scared by this tournament. Next, for next, this is more for moving them from regular to more competitive, is make your procedures more in line with competitive practices. This means have table numbers, have match slips, post pairings. These are things that we as judges do automatically, like we know at a larger tournament we do automatically, but some storms they don't do that. They just kind of like blah, 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 you're playing blah, 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 and that's all, they just announce things. And then at the end of the match it's like, ah, oh, I got in two. <clears throat> And that's all, the, all they do. So if you have a player that's used to that sort of format, just arrive at a GP, they have, no, they have this sheet of paper like, what's this? I've never seen a match slip ever. Who here has had a player that does not understand a match slip? <clears throat> yep, most of us have dealt with players. Or, or, or think, what does drop mean? Oh, I write no in drop, right? <laughs> I see the scorekeepers all like, oh god, stop it. So those are the things that you have to do. You start at your store level or at smaller events. That way players can get more comfortable with these processes because they don't really change that much. But getting them introduced to it is what's going to make those competitive stores seem less scary to them. Okay? Next, next is the, we will discuss the other half of tournaments is it's so expensive, I can't get into this. This is where we can do what I like to call bridge format pricing. This is where you kind of go like, well, this is the biggest format of this, biggest example of this, is probably the Mox Boarding House Racks of Riches, where it's like, you play Pauper, you get modern or legacy cards. That way, you move from one cheaper format, so you go like, oh look, we have Cheapo Supremo, the $25 vintage thing, you can get maybe some minor legacy cards. <clears throat> that way, we have one event, one lower event kind of feeding into the more competitive events. That way players are like, well, <clears throat> I didn't want to play this play in these tournaments because I don't have these cards, but I've played enough tournaments, I have some of this stuff, so maybe I'm willing to buy other things. Have Convincing store owners to understand that getting them into the format may cost them a little bit, but then they'll start buying things to round out their deck, and suddenly they'll see the profits come back. <clears throat> it's big when you're doing bridge, when you're doing what I call bridge format pricing. The next thing is sub-tournaments. People are looking at me like, what the heck is a sub-tournament? Sub-tournaments actually happen, the biggest one I know of is at Eternal Weekend, which is during the um, Vintage Champs, which is the, hey, we give a special prize to the person who finished the best with no power in their deck. That's what I call a sub-tournament, where you have a tournament in a tournament, where you have special mini objectives inside of there, where you can be like, hey, we can, do, we can do things where new players can feel welcome or try for an alternative objective when they feel like they can be competitive. Like, I don't have enough money to play in modern. I do not have a place that it fetches. You're like, 
have have a have a sub tournament being like winner of the sub tournament with no fetch land like no fetch lands is your sub tournament. They play without fetches and then you give a sub tournament prize. Maybe even bridge do <laughs> bridge it and be like you can get some fetches for doing it. What's up? No. He said Tron. Tron wins the no fetch lands. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah true. Or KCI actually. Tron or KCI, I guess the, 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 the maybe not a a b ideal yeah. example of that one, but still. <laughs> Storm. Storm. Yeah, I guess that could be a little bit. It's not great in modern. Yeah. But <laughs> stipulation <laughs> pricing be like, does have a good role. Stipulation But in modern, you can do like, you can, like a C, no dual lands kind of thing. You can do modern, you can do it too. It's just like, you have the names like, well, be like, add a card that you must include and be like, oh, well. Best modern deck containing, containing four elite vanguard, go. I thought he was going to go with Seance. <laughs> no, not I'm not going that far. When you do, that is the one thing about doing the stipulation or sub tournaments. Make sure that they're not complete buys. Like, make sure the card is actually somewhat relevant. Like, even elite vanguard is probably a little lower in the things you probably want to do. But don't put, don't make them play Dark Steel Relics. Like, don't do that kind of stuff. Make sure they still have some game against the other people. If you can't beat a competitive deck when their mana screwed, then you did a bad thing about making your stipulation tournament. <laughs> Let's just be honest. If you can't beat a mana screwed deck and you're gonna because you're playing a stipulation, that means your stipulation is not correct. So make sure you do that when you do your sub tournaments. So <clears throat> with that, I think we have time. I think we have some time for questions. I'm not sure how I am doing on timing because I don't have the clock open. But yeah, we're about that time. So any questions we have? So, as a, as a store owner, mm -hmm. and I'm like trying to bridge the gap here mm -hmm. for on all yep. access here, uh, I feel like prize support mm -hmm. is the biggest, um, I guess, hindrance to our player base, but also a good thing. Uh, I, I feel like we've almost created a very toxic environment where players feel that they need to be able to make their livelihood almost off of uh, their price, you know, off of our price support. Um, I think that it's been a big problem that they almost forget that Magic was meant to just be, you know, get together with friends and have fun. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody else at their local game store tends to have that problem almost, but... Mm -hmm. The EV hunters are out there. Yeah. They're just looking for so, the max out. If, if I can actually uh, add on to that. Um, so my local store, we actually have the opposite where, uh, situation with what we look for pricing. Um, so specifically for like PBDQs, like, or not PBDQs, mm -hmm. but like FNMs or pre-releases, mm -hmm. the pricing is kept distinctly low so everyone is able to get something or another, okay. regardless of what you finish, like pre-releases, like you get a pack per win, undefeated players get an extra pack. If you didn't win at all, you get a pay pack. Everyone will walk away with something. Um, and because of that, we've drawn it's quite a large crowd, but not anyone who is specifically like a grinder or anything like that. Like um, we, we switched to mm -hmm. something similar to a lower tier mm -hmm. system and got the biggest middle finger from our player base and they all dispersed. And I truly think that it's because myself mm -hmm. and a couple other store owners that are in our area, mm -hmm. we do inflate our price support. Well, at least yeah. I did for a little while too. So it, just, it, was, yep. it was getting too much. See, that's part of the communication of, like, as I said, get the store owners together and be like, this is what we're going to aim at. And one thing about, like, while the one thing that will balance out in the end is, yes, you may lose some of those hardcore grinder types. Yeah. Your hardcore grinder types, how often were they the spenders, though? Well, see, that's the thing is they, the people that complain the most mm -hmm. are usually the ones that spend the least. Exactly. So, so, at least real cash anyway. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so that's why that's there. that's the reason why we like we circle back to hey, what's our average skill level? And we need to push people towards things like like for example, the magic open house. Those are things we should promote and get people from all sorts of different areas, like or youth tournaments. Those are things that we can be like, let's shore up the player base of have of more of a diversity right. rather right. than my best customers have to be probably my tabletop at home players. 
Yep. Are probably by far the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And they are probably the most beneficial to the magic community because they go and they have fun with their friends at home. They get more people involved. They come into the store. They'll trickle in for pre-release, mm -hmm. but really they're not the grinder or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it, it's tough to reach out to those people yeah. to get them more, you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, built up into the magic community. Yeah. And that's part of, as I said earlier, like whenever I've said infrastructure people, the small community leaders, as you said, yeah. sometimes it might, the community may not be central at the store. It could be like, another great ones are like little work communities where like they play magic during their break time or they play, play board games at their break time. Those are like great target audiences where like, hey, we can meet up at the store and do that kind of stuff. <clears throat> like we can arrange for tournaments that are more friendly to what hours shall work. Like mm -hmm. those little things where you can help build the community be like, hey, we are open and welcoming. There's these, there's these the spike people on the fringes that aren't really that great. Like the spike people have a very interesting um, dynamic with the stores because you want them to be there to be like end bosses for your tournaments. Yes, that is, yeah. But on the flip side, you don't want them to be running your tournament and being like, I'm here to be the per be the sharks that eat all that eat, that descend upon people. Like it's good for the new players mm -hmm. when they beat the the, the end boss because yep. they're like, yeah, I did it, I finally did. Mm -hmm. and, it, and probably a lot of people that yeah. are have been <clears throat> playing Magic since I've been playing Magic mm -hmm. up in Michigan. I'll just throw his name out there. He was always our adversary at Gamer Saying Short is because that's where he started playing mm -hmm. was John Johnson, yeah. and we always that was the person that like you were just like. I want to beat John Johnson because that's all he does is play Magic. Yeah. So like, at some point, like those upper level players, we tolerate them because essentially they're content. They're not necessarily, we don't view them as players anymore. You view them as, okay, they are content for us to have. have. So we want them to be around enough, but we don't want to like cater absolutely to them. But we didn't want them to have enough fun where they want to stick around. <coughs> Another thing that really works with those players is if you can get those players to have casual friends. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting thing, the dynamic that occurs whenever one really spiky competitive player, suddenly like their casual friends get interested, then they get roped into doing these things and going to tournaments and doing all the stuff that are more on the casual end of things, and then they tend to tap down the spikiness if they can get into it. I'll be honest. Significant others are great for this. I mean, honest. <laughs> significant others of spiky players helps a lot in, in bringing them back down so they're not trying to crush every tournament and just do, look for Eevee and nothing else. So significant others, younger siblings, those are big ins. If you can get those, get them. Kids. Oh, kids. Kids and algorithm. Yeah. Chris, I mean, I've been seeing you guys just flourish with your modern community. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's, what's <coughs> I mean, not to say that mine's all that bad. I mean, we're mid twenties, you know, low thirties. I, but I mean, I'm seeing huge numbers out of your. I have a couple of key things. One is I don't put up with a lot of shit. Yeah. All right. So if somebody's, if somebody's causing an issue, I always try to give them the benefit of the, the benefit of the doubt and say like, Maybe they don't realize what they're doing. I've had a lot of situations where I've taken somebody aside and said, like, hey, do you understand that, like, every time you do this, like, you're impacting this person this way? And I've had genuine reactions of, like, I had no idea that that's how it was coming off. Like, I don't, I don't want to come off this way. I have this thing that I'm not very good at tracking, and it causes me to do these things sometimes, and I didn't even realize, and they feel terrible about it. So one of the things I, I really try to do is say, benefit of the doubt, let's go in here, let's, let's play the human card and say, what's going on? Why are you acting this way? Do you even understand the way that you are impacting those around you? Because a lot of people are like, I don't want to be a dick. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm getting mad at my deck and stuff like that. Yes, but the way you're projecting it, you're putting it off on the other person. You're putting it off on the people around you, and it brings it down. So I, I get in there, and I, and I, I spend a lot of time with people. Um, the other thing is uh, what we do and everything else is education. So I've had the players, mine are generally the Yu-Gi-Oh players, monsters. Um, <laughs> hey, <laughs> inclusivity. Yes, some of them are, are <clears throat> wonderful, and then yes, no. Um, so 
I have a lot of uh, Yu-Gi-Oh players, and I've had the Magic players that are like, well, why is this prize so low? And it's like, if you you try to give them the general, like, this is this is why it is the way it is, and they're just like, yeah, but why are the numbers so low? Yeah. It's like, a, listen, I will I will sit you down, and we will have a math class. I will explain this to you, and I will, and hopefully that will get through. That is usually the defining factor of mm-hmm. like. You, this person's going to get it, and they're going to work with you from then on because you explain to them, this is how we get the numbers up, and you can help me get those numbers up, and this is how we're going to do this together. Yeah. But if they're not catching that, if they're not, if they're just like, well, we want more, 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 it's like, don't worry, waste your time with them so much. Yeah. Put on your good event, run it smooth, have fun, but focus on the other guys and their continuous effort <coughs> in the community. The guys that are only there for the numbers and stuff like that, they'll see themselves out eventually. And unfortunately, those kind of guys aren't bringing people in. Yeah, it's it's just not a it's 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 almost a toxic uh, a toxic kind of thing. They're not they're not gr- helping grow your community by being those welcoming uh, ambassadors and stuff like that. So it's it's a lot of time and effort with individuals, and it's a lot of education because I've had a lot of people that are like. What, what happened to the prize sport here, man? And it's just like, well, this is what's going on, dude. Um, I had a guy before me that was doing numbers in a really crazy way, and uh, those aren't supportable. That's yeah. just not how it works, and yeah. here's why. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it, education is a really good tool. Yeah. And, like, having a welcoming community helps with other things. Like, a player could be, like, they play modern. Like, well, I always want to try out Scape Shift, but... I don't have the cards. And one person's like, well, you can borrow my Scape Shift deck or just like try out, play a couple game matches with it and then maybe they'll like it and then they'll go and buy it. Like, yeah. But having that community where like they're willing to help out and coordinate with each other is huge. My commander community does that like crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's the, like yeah, you were my, saying, get, get people c- yeah. cards and decks in, in their hands and stuff like that. <clears throat> exactly like that. One of the things that our local LPS <laughs> is they just have <laughs> store decks mm-hmm. left on the sides where players can say, yeah. I would like to try out this event, you know. Mm-hmm. I haven't played modern, and so they're like, well, here, if you want to give it a try, you know, like a standard player comes in, it's like, here, yeah. here's an affinity deck. Why don't you give it a shot, you know? Yeah. Play the events, whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's brawl decks at the store, because we, we were trying to push brawl. And mm-hmm. Another thing we were doing with mm-hmm. brawl is, mm-hmm. like, we play it more, like, instead of being competitive, we're like, mm-hmm. it's winners. Like, mm-hmm. at the end, they just... Yeah. Everybody gets a pack. You can't keep your own pack. You just pass it to somebody else you play oh, with. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And that's, it <clears> that's it cool. encourages players to just build more of a, a friendly, casual thing where they may not like the, the standard grind, mm-hmm. the 1v1s, but they might just like the social aspect that, that Brawl offers of yeah. playing like a table for people and just having a fun game. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, you know, it doesn't matter why you give them the pack. It's like, Hey, you beat me. Here's your pack. Or you were fun to play against. Your your deck's a real interesting, really jank brew. I love it. Here's a pack. Oh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you just and that's yeah. that's what the, the price for the brawl does, and yep. it gets people interested in the format, and it puts it puts bodies in seats, and mm-hmm. that's what you're yeah. a lot of. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not a store owner or anything, but I, I do know that there's a yeah. lot of stuff that it, it depends on. Like, if you have mm-hmm. high showing up in the number of the tournaments, it's, yeah. it get looks the, good. Get the butts in the seat, the rest will come. Yeah, yeah. yeah. get the butts in the seats, and you need to get, Building the critical mass where it starts growing is difficult. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. as judges and community builders, our, our job is to get people from... I'm gonna brew this in my head, think it's a good idea, <laughs> to having the cards in front of him and playing the game. Yeah. Convincing him to get to that point is big. And <clears throat> that's what you but that's what we need to do to build our communities. It's like get them down. Even if it's on it's sharpies and sheets of paper at the very beginning, get them down. Get them to play. You mentioned uh, identifying like potential <clears throat> L1s yeah. in the community yeah. and stuff like that, and I think that's great. Yeah. I also like doing that with like community heads, yeah. like somebody that <clears throat> could potentially help be a, a face or a figurehead in a particular community or something like that. And then you do that, you also get that like that inclusivity and you get into those Facebook groups and stuff like that as well. Yeah. You, you identify the people that are just going to make your life easier and you make them feel a little bit more special mm-hmm. so that they're more likely to help you out. Yep. So. Well, I think we're good here. I think they're. I think they're meeting back up. So I think we. Yeah, might that was great. Yay! Just go by.